Thank you, everybody, for joining. This is Momentum Academy's first talk of 2023, and we are excited to have you join us as we go through Web3's brutal year. So we want to take you uh, through the journey of what happened last year and a bit about what's happening, going to happen this year. Uh, next slide. So a bit about Momentum Academy. So we are a part of Momentum Works and we help leaders immerse in innovation, validate and execute their strategies. So this is one of the talks that we do and we also do immersions, workshops and case studies. Um, next slide. Some of our partners that you can see. Next slide. And um, what is it really exciting that we did last year was that uh, we analyzed a global expansion of 20 plus tech companies. Uh, next slide. And our CEO, Jangan and Professor Chen from INSEAD launched a book called Seeing the Unseen, which is about uh, behind Chinese tech giants global venturing. So uh, next slide. And uh, we are a team of experienced practitioners with uh, experience in more than 15 countries and four continents, and some of which who will be here with us today. Okay, next slide. Uh, since 2020, 2020 uh, we've been launching a number of um, reports on the macro and investment industry, e-commerce e and food delivery, uh, FinTech digital banks, uh, company anatomy, and the latest one since last year was Web3. So here we're gonna be sharing more of our insights and um, point of view on this industry. Next slide. So uh, I'll pass it on to Jangan. Good afternoon and uh, happy new year. Um, we know that a lot of you have been playing with uh, this new tool called uh, ChatGPT um, over the last uh, a month. And, uh, and and naturally for us to 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 understand what Web three is, we went to chat chat uh, GPT. We asked the question, "What is Web 3 So it gave a four paragraph response, and we looked through it. It's actually pretty good, and it's better than many um, analysts would be able to do. Uh, next page, please. But it was a bit too long, so so we asked um, GPT to to define Web three in one sentence. So here's the result. Web3 is a term used to describe the use of blockchain technology and decentralized protocols to enable new capabilities and create a more secure and transparent internet. We do know that uh, a lot of uh, blockchain and crypto um, original gangsters, OGs, actually do hate this term because they said, I mean, it's just about blockchain. Uh, what's the point of having all these fancy terms? But, um, but I, think, uh, I think it is important to understand that for technology to take hold of wider adoption, we need more than just a, a few enthusiasts. I mean, you do need massive adoption. You do need some 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 passwords that everyone can understand. Next page, please. So over the next uh, hour that we have here, um, we're going to talk about a few things. Um, Web three. How did we get here? And and obviously you have seen all, all the happenings uh, in twenty twenty two, which is a drastic reversal from twenty twenty one. So how did we get here? Uh, FTX, which is in headlines at every day. I think this morning there were also another stories, um, a few stories about FTX. So, so will it change the industry? And if so, how? And uh, top of mind in 2023, and I'm sure some of you have been reading a lot of predictions by different pundits. So in our opinion, and th three things we should be looking at, regulations, business applications, as well as investments. And of course, in each of them, there'll be nuances which we will discuss in more detail. And uh, of course, um, what will uh, GPT think? Because we, we do think that GPT would have um, a pretty significant impact on Web3, but how does that exactly take shape? So uh, I'm going to pass that to, to Sania to, to, to explain what happened in the last two years. Sam, please. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year as well. So in order to really dive into Web3 this year and, and the year before, we're going to take it back even further to 2021, which was the year that the hype really built up and Bitcoin became almost a household name, quite understandably, because as we can see, we have organizations that we'd already placed a whole lot of trust in, such as Tesla buying $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin at the beginning of the year. 
Then, of course, throughout the course of the year, Board Ape Yacht Club infamously launched Sky Mavis, the creators of Axie Infinity, actually became a unicorn towards the end of the year. And then, of course, we ended 2021 on quite a high with Bitcoin actually hitting its all time high of almost 70,000 US dollars. And then came 2022. This was the brutal year. It's when it all really started uh, to come crashing down, which really began with Terra Luna's stablecoin being depegged early on in the year and crashing subsequently, which also led with, um, in addition to over leveraging, which also led Three Arrows Capital as well as Celsius to experience a, a massive downfall midway through the year. And that really has you know, carried on and trickled down into investor and public sentiment being very down right now. And of course, with the collapse of FTX that very recently happened, um, this, this has really continued. But in the background, there's been a lot of quiet building, um, enterprises adopting blockchain, which we will cover a little bit more in detail later. And of course, Ethereum completing the merge and setting a very high standard for te tech upgrades in real time in the future. But at first, we would be remiss to not address the biggest elephant in the Bahamas or New York or California or wherever he is now. This photo was actually just taken a few months ago, and oh, how the mighty have fallen. This is a company that we and many others had paid, placed immense trust in, and investors were flocking to them. I mean, you can see the optimism on their faces. We even have the prime minister of the Bahamas standing next to everyone's favorite haircut, SBF. And look where we are now. Um, and so I will pass this back to Jungan to talk a little bit more about. Yep. So, so obviously, um, uh, even now with Elon Musk uh, taking over Twitter, we still see a lot of uh, different information sources, people voicing their opinions on Twitter. And, uh, and same for this episode, a, a lot of things uh, came on Twitter, but of course, um, uh, the figureheads of industry had this direct communication with people. Um, two things which I think are particularly interesting. First uh, is what CZ said uh, of Binance. Do not borrow if you run a crypto business. Do not use capital efficiently. Have a large reserve. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And, uh, and second is what Vitalik said, um, compliance virtual signaling. Because uh, we did speak with a few um, investors who put money, uh, some of them large sums of money into FTX. And, um, and everybody had uh, this uh, thesis that uh, that uh, if this industry is ever going to be regulated, they are in, in a good position because um, because they are engaging with the regulators and they are close to the, to the to the real decision makers. Next page, please. Yeah. So a little bit more about this this virtual signaling, which uh, which I think more and more details are being revealed, and. Uh, uh, SBF went to testify um, before the Congress uh, in 2021. I think that moment when he when he said members of Congress were really really skeptical, that was super exciting. So so so, so that test, uh, testimonial I think gave lots of confidence to both institutional investors who put money with FTX as a company, as well as retail investors who put money with um, um, with FTX. I mean to trust that okay this is a good place place for you to invest um, in in crypto assets. Um, and it was revealed like recently that what was previously thought of 40 million political donations, mostly to Democrats, uh, is actually close to 80 million. So, so a lot of um, uh, efforts went into uh, making this company sound legit. Um, but of course, uh, as, as we have learned recently, and uh, this money didn't really came from uh, the money they actually made. Next page, please. So um, what exactly happened? I think you guys can read all the detail. I think this has been extensively co covered. So FTX as exchange moved customer funds to a trading firm, which, um, which, also con which is controlled by the same person. Uh, we do know that a number of exchanges are doing the same thing. But the question is that, uh, I mean, when the market is good, um, you, you, I mean, you, you take leverage, you, you multiply your returns. But when, when the market is bad or, or, or certain things happen, it could leave a big hole, and a hole that is so big in the case of FTX that uh, that it can't recover from. So um, in traditional finance, this is very, very uh, tightly regulated. Of course, there are still issues happening, but can you imagine Nasdaq taking your money to trade um, on, on their own? Next page, please. Um, many people have um, drawn parallels 
between SBF and uh, Madoff, Bernie Madoff, who also had great hairdo. Uh, but of course, um, the schemes are a bit different. The magnitude of the loss is different, and the time period of uh, of the scheme are coming out um, and before it was finally sort of uh, collapsing is also different. But um, but of course, um, one thing that happened after the the metal scheme, as well as all issues uh, in the great financial crisis, was uh, enhanced regulations, which um, which became a burden for lots of organizations in the ecosystem. What will happen after um, this episode, the FTX crash? And of course, the story is still unfolding. There's lots of um, um, voices. There's lots of pressure on different people. How exactly will regulators react to that? I think we, we do have a bit of an extensive talk about that uh, later in the session. Uh, next page, please. And we, would, we think about all these institutions which failed, we, all these crypto institutions which failed last year. Um, and some of them, some of them three arrow capital, uh, Bible finance, uh, services, etc., were regarded as being brilliant um, in a in a bull market of crypto. Uh, but of course, um, without adequate regulated re regulations or adequate uh, governance, uh, what they did was um, was similar to what has been happening in finance of the centuries, which is uh, taking excessive leverage. Which allows, uh, which basically makes you collapse um, in in bad times, and uh, that's that's something which um, which was very interesting in the crypto space because many of these organizations were new, and uh, and uh, the money that they had, which which generated very quickly, and uh, the, the 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 move the movement of money, lending, etc. Amongst these institutions, it was sometimes even informal, so you don't have the the, the complicated due diligence. And uh, and the process is before money is transferred from one party to another party, and uh, and what happened uh, after all these collapses is all this trust is probably broken, and uh, and it will probably take a long time to build this trust. So 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 some of the issues are familiar; they just happen very rapidly. Next page, please. I'm going to pass pass it back to to, to Sania on this. Thanks, John. So as we've heard, you know, FTX is definitely CFI or centralized finance. But does that mean that we can classify FTX as Web3? To understand that, we will really have to take a look at the differences between centralized finance and decentralized finance, CFI and DeFi. So let's look at this through the eye of exchanges, right? So centralized finance exchanges are FTX, Binance, Coinbase, some of the biggest names we've seen. They are run by single entities. All of the power is controlled by the people who run the companies. Um, they often serve as custodians as well for these crypto assets, the same way that banks do with traditional finance and deposits. On the other side, we have DeFi. And some of the popular examples of this are like PancakeSwap and Uniswap. Decentralized exchanges really just serve as a platform to connect investors um, in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. They exist in a completely unregulated financial landscape. And so DeFi is actually what Web3 traditionalists wanted and what crypto was built to underpin. But the biggest of these CFIs is Binance. Binance has over six times the trading value, volume of Coinbase, which is its next biggest competitor. And there are some rumors that it is in liquidity trouble. The fallout, as we can see, would be so much worse than FTX. And so the trillion dollar question of this year is really, will Binance survive 2023? So speaking of, let's turn our attention to this coming year. What exactly is it that is going to happen in 2023? We're going to look at this in three veins now. Regulation, business applications and enterprises adopting the blockchain, and investment and investor sentiment. So I'm going to pass it to your Lynn to speak a little bit more about the regulations. Okay, thank you. Okay, regulations are my favorite. Okay, uh, next page. Okay, so um, after the FTX uh, collapse, um, the regulators, I mean, there was so much noise in the media is calling for regulators to regulate the crypto industry. And here is just a screenshot of uh, what were, were actually announced in the news. You know, uh, Germany calling for global regulation of crypto, New York financial regulators issues crypto guidance for banks. Next slide. 
And it's a bit confusing to us. Next slide. Uh, and we had a discussion in the team on what is Web3 as we were doing this, uh, this pre uh, presentation. So some said that Web3, uh, how do you explain Web3 to a layman? So some said that Web3 is blockchain plus tokens. Another one said that Web3 is blockchains plus decentralization. Uh, and we don't necessarily need tokens. Then somebody said, yes, you can transact without tokens. But then how do you economically uh, motivate a, a person at scale if tokens are not included? And uh, somebody else said that, oh, by the way, NFTs are also tokens. So should they be regulated and by who, right? And if, as you can see, even within a team, we are still trying to make sense of it so much. So even though we have actually published quite a number of reports, right? So what's so about the layman? So next page. And if you go back to the fundamental uh, questions that regulators grapple with day in, day out, right? And uh, these are the, we, we want to, we, I think regulators are asking themselves, should they be ahead of innovation? Should they treat crypto as securities? And what do they see as crypto, right? What exactly are they regulating? Is it the CFI? Is it the DeFi? Is it the uh, assets, the, the crypto assets? Is it, should it be NFTs? Who should be regulating it, right? And more fundamentally, what is the role of the regulators in this ecosystem, right? But one thing that we do um, have a very strong point of view is that anybody that says that regulators should only regulate things that they understand um, is wrong, is obnoxious and is wrong because we are all learning in this ecosystem. Next slide. And so we did a deeper dive into what are the objectives of financial regulators. And here's a snapshot of um, from the MES, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, their, their objectives, right? And just to uh, draw out that point in the in the circle, their objective, if you if you were to sum it up in a, some a few simple words, would be to uphold the integrity and reputation, to prevent systemic risk, and to protect retail investors. Right. So let's uh, go back to the FTX scandal to see how um, does it meet the criteria. Next slide. Okay, so well, although there are so much hype about FTX and that it's going to uh, bring the uh, doom and gloom to the to the crypto industry, and on on a grand scale of things, let's just put this into um, into its place, right? So starting from the left, um, I think some of us have invested in Tesla stocks, and in twenty twenty two, Tesla market uh, cap actually lost about seven hundred billion dollars, right? And you can see that arrow there. I'm just going to jump a bit. That's largely thanks to the, the fourth little um, circle there, Musk acquired Twitter for 44 billion, right? And we don't, and, and see how it is going now. So back to the first picture. So for those of us who have actually invested in Tesla, we would have, the entire market lost $700 billion worth of uh, uh, value in 2022. Going down one, the Lehman Brothers collapse cost um, a big chunk of the um, market there, okay? And going, going back, liabilities of China Evergrande um, was 300 billion, right? And that is very big in, uh, the, uh, mass acquiring Twitter for 44 billion is uh, just over 10% of this. And then if you see FTX in the whole scale of things, it's 8 billion. So is this uh, the question that I think all regulators are asking themselves, despite the media, media uh, scrutiny is, um, is FTX collapse big enough to be a systemic risk, right? Next page. And we're going off a tangent, right? Um, to try to try to draw some parallels. Why did Chinese regulators come down hard on Ant Group only after a decade of Ant being uh, doing financials? Jangan, do you want to take, th take this? Sure. Um, I think over the last uh, four or five years, we have had lots of discussions with people um, who were in the ecosystem in China for payment um, in early days. Um, people who were involved in Ant Group, with people who were involved in their competitors, people who were in the banks and uh, working with Ant or, or, or trying to sort of, you know, I mean, convince their bosses to do something that Ant was doing, and also people working with the regulators. So. Um, there was lots of uh, lots of um, opinions uh, about what should be done because this is clearly financial uh, innovation and uh, there's lending business and the, the lending business business was growing uh, very rapidly. What should the regulators do? So, and, and also at the end of the day, I mean, 
amongst all the different regulators, um, there are four of them, uh, the four main ones in China, uh, which 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 are actually um, concerning the the ants business areas and who should take what action, and um, and of course. Um, if they acted earlier, uh, created regulations, and and uh, we'll probably not see the adoption of um, of uh, of consumer fintech, mobile payment, etc., as we are seeing today. I mean, th this is what we see in in, in multiple mac markets that uh, things are evolving a little bit more differently compared to China. Um. So so, but when a risk becomes too much, right? When did uh, I mean? Did the leverage that uh, that the consumer lending business was taking become uh, too much for for uh, to create actually a systemic risk and uh, and poses sort of dangers to retail retail investors and consumers. So so there were, there were lots of discussions over the years and uh, and I think it took a long time for for the regulators to to to, to come together to act. Um, so it is what it is and. Um, and uh, I think we should not argue for regulators to come in too early because um, because otherwise, I mean, the the the, the landscape will come um, will become very different. Um, what could probably be interesting uh, as what what we are seeing in India and a number of the countries in Southeast Asia is that um, is the regulators, I mean, bringing the participants together to build to build infrastructure. I mean, this came a little bit late uh, in China's case. The next page, please. So of course we have argued that uh, C5 should be regulated because uh, they function in the same way as um, as many of the traditional finance uh, institutions. Uh, the question is that I mean who bears the heavy cost of regulation regulations? And uh, and 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 if you can see from these three images, I mean um, the first two after each major major financial crisis um, or major sort of scandal, a, a new act is enacted more compliance requirements, more reporting requirements. A lot of jobs are created to just deal with this. And of course, I mean, many things get delayed. I mean, companies couldn't focus their, their attention on building the business. And uh, the question is that, I mean, if there were ever to be any regulation, how should that take shape? And, uh, and a more fundamental question is that, could, should DeFi ever be regulated? Uh, next page. Uh, over to you, Sam. Thanks, Jenan. So for our second facet, let's look at some of the trends within enterprises adopting blockchain technology. So while the headlines and quite frankly, our attention has been focused on FTX and a lot of the crypto collapse, blockchain adoption has quietly started to sink in. So you can see some of the companies here, JP Morgan, DBS, Sony Global Education, even the Singapore government has been dabbling and, and implementing blockchain technology. And we're gonna go through some of these in more detail. So if you're in Singapore, you have knowingly or unknowingly been already interacting with the blockchain. The government has developed something called open attestation, which is a platform primarily used in three ways as we've listed here, health certs, open certs, and trade trust. So health certs has actually been used to verify the status of our COVID vaccinations through the blockchain in real time. Open certs does the same for school and university degrees and diplomas. You can see here, they use it to verify that they are valid at the time that you are opening them. But why? This can all be done without the blockchain. So the open attestation framework from the source itself says that it is the base framework behind these three use cases. Open attestation is an open source framework using blockchain to issue cryptographically trustworthy documents, which can be verified independently without the need for proprietary software equipment. And I would place a lot of emphasis on the tail end of that sentence. So Web3 has also been quietly working in the background. We have example two here with ticketing, NFT ticketing more specifically. So it looks like different things at different times. It can look like what we have on the left here where users are actively buying NFTs on an NFT marketplace and knowingly purchasing these NFTs to then use as tickets. But on the right here, this looks more like a normal ticket. This is a UI that we are all used to. This is actually for a Broadway show. 
And what it does is verify that the ticket belongs to that person, the account that it's logged into in real time to prevent fraud by using the blockchain. But the key here is that users don't actually know that they are interacting with the blockchain when they're doing this. And on to example three, we have Quorum here. So Quorum was a tool, it is a tool and a platform that was developed by JP Morgan in 2016 slash 2017. So we're looking at six to seven years ago. And it was sold to consensus in 2020. But JP Morgan actually launched the interbank network on it in 2017. Since then, it has gone on to have a, car, a bunch of current users, many names that we are familiar with, such as Singapore Airlines, Ant Group, LVMH, Microsoft, to do the things that we've listed here on the right, such as interbank payments, loyalty programs, supply chain transaction processing. But again, all of this can be done without the blockchain. So why all the hassle? So um, I think I think to take a step back, um, corporates are very practical creatures, right? Uh, especially now with so many regulations and compliance they need to meet with, they, why would they dabble in blockchains if they didn't see the, the return on investment? So we dug a deep deeper. So Quorum is um, to, to the, the way I think Simon explained it was really was really smart. Um, it's just like actually having an open uh, blank piece of uh, PowerPoint that you can actually do whatever you want on it or like a WordPress for anybody who creates website. You can do whatever you want on it. It's yours. That's that's the power of Quorum, right? And um, and Quorum could actually help uh, organization. Um, uh, ha uh, it's a platform for organizations like HSBC, UBS. Um, uh, or LVMH to create private chains and consortium chains, right? So what is what are private chains, right? So I think, and why 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 would corporate corporations bother? Well, what is private chains, John? Maybe you want to explain this. Yeah, so a private chain essentially is able to leverage all of the tools of the blockchain by having multiple nodes, so multiple points where you verify information that are being that is being updated on the blockchain, but you have the advantage of being able to oversee all of it. So with a public blockchain mm -hmm. like Ethereum, everyone can see all the transactions in real time. With a private chain, you get to decide who you allow into your chain, who you allow to see the information, and you can keep it entirely within your organization. Mm. And we had this discussion and I asked Sun, so why wouldn't an organization just hire one person that they trust just to do that, right? And um, and I think I think this went on for a while. And I think the answer was that was this box on the right. This is the kind of aha eureka moment that if if you had one person that you really really trust, you would still have the operational problems that you had, like reconciliation, right? So imagine if let's say you are doing a payment business and you have one customer, and, th and this is for loyalty. And if you have one customer that does ten transactions a day. Now imagine if you had 100,000 customers. Can you imagine that poor person at the other end who needs to do this reconciliation, right? And there's going to be human errors. There's going to be uh, somebody needs to check it. And I, I pity the person that needs to check as well. Um, and then the, the time to actually release the payment to the vendor or whomever is going to take time. So I think, I think um, companies are aware that this is an operational problem. Of course, you have your internal database. Of course, you can actually have, a, um, uh, but it's still, but it, there's still going to be errors and, and, and this kind of lag. So I think this is why they are testing it out with uh, these something, some sort of private chains where you can still have the autonomy, you can still control it, uh, but it can still benefit from the from the um, uh, technology of the blockchains, right? And the caveat is that this is still in early stages, uh, but some applications we know have gone beyond POC, okay? So that's the, the private chain. And I think, I think we'll see more and more of this going forward. And then you have the consortium chains, right? So what exactly is a consortium chain, San? So a consortium chain is similar, but it's when a group of companies or organizations get together to create a chain and then each organization or each company acts as its own node. They can then collectively validate transactions and maintain a common record of those transactions or, or a ledger, for example. Mm. 
Okay, so then again, back to the business application, this one I totally understand. And I think it, it makes a lot of sense because like today, for example, we we have more than one bank account, right? And let's say um, tomorrow, if, uh, if I wanted to uh, open another bank account or do a transaction from one bank A to bank B, uh, this kind of consortium chain that the banks create themselves would be really useful. It is just a collaboration with these uh, banks. But in this instance, it's more like you can, uh, ex um, each bank can do KYC on the customers by themselves, right? When the money gets transferred, instead of me having, instead of me having to email this customer's information to a second, another bank, the bank has to do KYC, which you'll get an email saying that we are in the process of doing due diligence, we'll get back to you soon, right? So this can be done, um, um, uh, faster, right? And it will be at lower cost. And it is uh, easily ad uh, adaptable because there is a real uh, current use case, right? So, and the, the best thing is that it is not truly decentralized. So you, there's still people controlling it. So I think, and I, and I understand why corporations would want to use this. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's something interesting um looking looking for it and compared to private public chains so now that we know now, now i think now we have a better understanding of what's private and consortium versus public chains so why would public chains not be able to to uh, satisfy this kind of like needs of the of the banks or the corporates uh, son so the reason i think is that you know the public would have access to all of the records with Ethereum with Bitcoin, you can actually go online and see every single live transaction in real time, which takes away all of the privacy that you would want with, say, your banking information, right? And of course, there are consensus mechanisms that require everyone to be a participant. Again, takes away all of your the privacy that you would want with something like a bank account. So, so if I may just you know try to put my uh, finger on it, so the private chains and the consortiums. Could it be the evolution of Web3, where Web3 is not truly decentralized, but it's something that's being, being the technology is being harnessed to meet the needs of the uh, the, the current uh, organizations, the people, and uh, whilst um, um, having somebody still in control of it? Exactly. It's the least amount of decentralization necessary to still maintain everybody's interests. And these uh, banks and organizations are still being regulated in a sense. So I think it's sort of like yeah. the kind of middle ground for everyone, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so there you go. The three the three use cases of uh, of Web three. Okay. I hope I hope that was useful. So uh, let's move on. Uh, next slide. So I think this is uh, Jangan. Oh. Before that, I would like to mention a quick point about consortium chain. So, um, and, and obviously, I mean, in a market, this, this concept is, um, it has lots of benefits that people have been talking about. And we do see a few initiatives being, being undertaken to, um, to, to, to basically for, for, for companies to come together to maintain a common, common record and, uh, and validate it, I mean, through um, a consensus amongst these organizations. Um, but of course, um, the, this huge debate of, um, of what exactly is the benefit and also, also what exa exactly is the drawback of doing that. Um, so, so here we just listed the benefits, right? But, uh, but if, you, um, if you do a little bit of the research on the drawbacks that you can find about consulting chains, and of course, aside from the, the, the religious part of not being decentralized enough, uh, there are two drawbacks people usually talk about. Uh, first, um, is lack of standard. I mean, different like consortiums are trying to create their own standard uh, versus public chain where, where you, you're potentially based on one standard. But uh, but I don't see that as a big problem because uh, this is what's happening with any new technology, right? I mean, some industry players are trying to uh, create their own standard or create their own applications. And at some point in time, they'll, they'll come together and try to try to harmonize and form a standard. And sometimes the, the market will take its natural course uh, for, for a standard to form. Um, the second uh, common drawback, drawback that people refer to is um, is the consortium chain compared to a public chain is easier to hack because um, because obviously you don't have as many nodes to to, to validate these transactions. Um, but um, of course, of course, um, so it's, 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 I mean, if we have five nodes that uh, to, to 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 form a, a consensus or five five, five nodes, it's probably easier compared to um, 
the public chains where you have a lot of nodes and uh, a, a very costly to to uh, to actually change the consensus. So, but but the question is that I mean, these five nodes, uh, let's say it's five banks, right? I mean, they are managed by um, five large organizations which have a lot of uh, I mean, in their own servers, which has a lot of. Uh, systems already put in place over the years about cybersecurity, about access control. So, so that might not necessarily fall into the domain of a blockchain or Web3 is, is the security of their own ecosystems. But anyway, so um, to the next page, please. Yeah, um, you guys, um, for those who are in uh, the IT industry, you might be familiar with uh, this Gartner's uh, hype cycle of emerging tech. So they do that. Um, Quite regularly, and and uh, the cycle works that any any new technology uh, that is promising would um, be hyped up uh, fairly quickly, and of course, lots of uh, lots of money put in, lots of uh, lots of effort, and uh, lots of buzz, um, and uh, companies, uh, public companies in the space would uh, enjoy a surge of uh, market cap, etc. But afterwards, what will happen is that the the, the hype will die down. And, uh, and and of course uh, the bubble will burst, et cetera, et cetera. So the tail end of the curve where you see that growing up uh, um, like gradually, this is where the, the real applications are, are starting to take shape. So so according to them, this is released, uh, I think earlier last year. So um, Web3 was close to the, the top of the hype. Um, we might argue that now it's already over the top, but decentralized, I, uh, identity NFT, uh, according to them, was were already off the top. I mean, the, the detailed position of um, of a, a particular technology is probably less important than how we perceive that things will move um, forward. And as we have explained uh, just now by San and Yolin, uh, applications are already taking shape. And I think largely thanks to um, to to all this buzz uh, which happened in 20, 20 and 2021, and more people are aware of this, more people are paying attention to this. Um, and, uh, and and of course, uh, moving forwards. Um, so 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 certain part of the ecosystem has already been educated, and uh, you might not even need the buzzword to actually create real applications. So that's why we said, okay, words to look out for: decentralized, distrib distributed ledger. Because at the end of the day, it's a ledger, non-transferable. So so these are um, the the uh, active um, practical uses of uh, of blockchain that have been put in place. And, um, and 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 obviously you, you might not even see the word blockchain or, or web three being used when, when when people are building applications. Um, next, please. The last thing we're talking about is investment, and uh, obviously um, there the, are the two elements of that, right? I mean, first is the sort of individual investment um, into into the into the coins and stuff, which which took a big hit, and uh, and even this week we're looking at the different predictions people are making. About uh, about Bitcoin. I mean, some predictions are saying that hey, I will go down to um, thirteen thousand by end of this month. Some will say that okay, will stay. But rarely you see someone who say that okay, you will go back to to the level a year ago very quickly. But anyway, so here we look at I mean institutional investment, and especially when you look at um, how to invest in companies in the space. Um, next page, please. So, um, how should investors invest in Web three? especially web three startups. So uh, unlike in web two, where I think the infrastructure has already largely been built. Um, so, so where people's investments are many applications. Uh, in web three, now I think people have come to a, to a consensus that it's still in early stages. I mean, um, it's easy to create a blockchain now, but the, the, free, the full uh, servicing uh, infrastructure is probably not fully ready yet, or at least not fully, uh, Adopted, so which means that, that there's room for improvement, there's room for disruption. Um, so 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 there's one school of thought saying that hey, um, because ado uh, adoption is so low, I mean compared to the population in this world, so what we should really do is to to improve on the infrastructure, and I mean to I mean that amongst the four layers, um, we should be invest in interface infrastructure and protocol layers instead of applications because uh, applications will take a bit of time to actually come. Um, aside from all, all the hype which happened in the last two years, uh, there's another group of thought of people who said that um, infrastructure is already there, and um, no matter how much you try to improve, 
um, the, probably the difference is not exactly in technology. It's not exactly in uh, how better you can do uh, uh, certain things. So, so, so the hunt should be focused on killer apps. A Web3 version of WhatsApp, for example, or Web3 version of whatever. So, 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 so we know a bunch of people who are actually focused their attention on that. Um, and obviously, which one's the right strategy? Next page, please. I would just want to use a, use a few sort of um, examples to illustrate this. Um, we, we know that over the last few years, uh, a number of uh, public chains have been created, which are supposed to do a better job compared to Ethereum because people are complaining about Ethereum being congested, high gas fees, slow transactions, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the thing is that, I mean, um, Solana, Polygon, which were better uh, than Ethereum or than the previous version of Ethereum in many ways, um, they didn't gain as much traction as Ethereum has. I mean, this is something which is interesting about any new technology, right? Once you form a community, once people are using it, um, you have to be drastically better for people to move from where they were to where you are. And, uh, and it just the uh, incremental benefits will probably not move um, the masses. So, so, and also Ethereum continue to, to evolve itself. It has a figurehead, it has a group of engineers working on it, and it did the merge quite successfully last year. Um, this is the first thing. So, 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 so the question is that, I mean, if you invest in a new ecosystem or if you invest um, in some of the emerging uh, protocols, does it make sense? Um, the second is that um, despite all, all the hype for the metaverse, decentralized has only, um, if, you, if, you, if you follow some of the tracking services, um, less than 1,000 daily transacting users. But of course, I mean, Decentraland um, put out a, a disclaimer afterwards saying that, uh, well, should, here you're actually talking about people who are actually making transactions, but people who are actually visiting Decentraland is about eight times that size, 8,000 people, which, um, which for a unicorn valu valuation company is tiny. So, so the question is that, um, how long will it take for metaverse to take shape and uh, will it ever take shape? And if it takes, takes shape, and who should, who would be the winner? Would that be some of these companies or would that be Meta, which has been dumping lots of resources and money into it? Um, so um, the apps um, or the companies with a real engaged community um, do not need professional investors and, and can still raise to token sale. I mean, the community is willing to contribute to, to, to the services and, and games they really believe in. Uh, I'm actually now in Ho Chi Minh City. I've, I mean, over the last two days, I've, I've, I've been talking to a lot of friends who are in the Web3 space here. I mean, making investments or building companies. Um, one number I got from somebody who is investing here is that uh, he has counted about 400 uh, funded teams building different kinds of web free applications here in Vietnam. Um, so, so the question that which one will eventually take shape and, uh, and, 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 and as an investor, which one should you put money in? It's, it's actually not easy, easy decision. So um, the last point, I mean, security will be a big, big issue. We know, we'll know that, I mean, after a few high, high profile hacks last year that we need to do something about it. But the question is that who will be able to do it? And, uh, and uh, who will be able to actually make lots of money while doing it instead of just providing a service? I mean, creating something which is which is really scalable. So, so if you look at a strategy, um, so on the right of this page is the um, is the basic portfolio of, of a sixteen Z um, crypto fund. I think now it's like seven eight billion uh, fund uh, across three funds. So they have been really investing in lots of companies in different uh, uh, parts of the ecosystem. The question is that um, if a, another investor who is uh, not fully focused on, on Web3, are you able to do the level of research that's deep enough to actually understand all these different uh, business models or these emerging technologies? And actually, even if you spray, I mean, spray on, a, on the right things which might eventually uh, sprout. So we, we do have a, a lot more information about this covered in our previous reports uh, of the last year. So you, you, you can go to our website to, to find out more. Um, next page, please. And uh, we, we started this talk with, uh, um, with uh, ChatGPT, but uh, of course, I mean, the whole uh, the space of generative AI. 
has been creating lots of buzz. And, uh, and, and I, I mean, if you watch LinkedIn or, or TechCrunch, you will know that uh, there are lots of companies which are already branding themselves as, as the chat, uh, chat GPT of X, chat GPT of Y. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, which, which really reminds you of the old Uber days that everything's an Uber of something. Um, but here we have illustrated three um, places, um, marketplaces, um, prompt sort of um, um, uh, databases, et cetera, et cetera. This is where you find applications um, built on top of uh, chat GPT. Um, so, so as you can see, uh, the public release of uh, ChatGPT was only about a month ago, and so many things have already been been created on top of that. Um, and uh, and and we know so many, not so many, but uh, but quite a number of prominent AI companies uh, deciding to completely pivot because of this ChatGPT. I mean, it doesn't make sense for anybody else to to create the same model and uh, type the same data, etc. anymore because you you can't do a better job compared to compared to uh, GPT-3 or ChatGPT. So, so lots of things are happening here and, uh, and there's lots of excitement. Um, lots of people are following, lots of um, developers who are previously focused on Web3 uh, now trying to pivot into, into AI. And of course, I mean, there's lots of buzz and, uh, and, and a key possibility here is that uh, you would take the money away and the attention away from Web3. So, so is that a good thing for Web3 as a space or is that a bad thing? Um, so, so it's actually interesting to watch what would exactly happen this year. We take the bus away, uh, the, ser the serious determined um, uh, developers might uh, have more attention to actually build what they want to build I mean, away from all the bus, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but the lack of competition might not necessarily be a good thing. I mean, for for a sector to evolve fast. Uh, next page. So, so we asked uh, ChatGPT for a conclusion for this talk, and uh, and the question exactly we asked is that will we see a merge of generative AI and Web three? And um, um, honestly, again, this is better than many analysts would be able to produce. And, um, and, and we look at that, um, the way that the things are uh, produced, uh, are sort of generated, uh, the content is uh, it's really eloquent. It probably took them a lot of time to train, um, to train the, 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 the portal model, to train the algorithm to, to actually talk in a language that make humans uh, on the receiving end feel comfortable. So um, if, you, if you look at the, this description uh, towards the end, um, I'm just going to read this. It is worth noting that the integration of these two technologies is still in early stages of development. And, and I actually, to be fair, I mean, both technologies are in early stages of development. Um, and it is difficult to predict exactly how they will evolve in the future. So, so you see uh, Web3, of course, it has its figureheads and it has some, um, it has some, um, um, it has a lot of enthusiasts and et cetera, et cetera. But for generative AI, uh, open AI specifically, it has Microsoft uh, behind it and putting lots of resources and, and, uh, and looking at the potential of integrating that into Bing search, um, uh, into, into Office, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of possibilities there. And, uh, and the CEO of, uh, of Open AI, Sam Altman, you, 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 some of you guys probably know that he's actually the the, the the previous uh, uh, CEO of uh, Y Combinator. And uh, if you look at the latest uh, actual companies coming out of Y Combinator, some of them are actually already based or, or already built in their stories to be chat GPT related. So, so there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, lots of actions there. Um, so I, I, think, uh, I think to conclude, it is clear that there's potential for gener generative AI and Web3 to be used together in a variety of applications. And it's likely that we will see further developments in the area in the coming years. So this is something that we will continue to, continue to focus on uh, for this year, because um, uh, I, I think all of us are working hard in our respective area. And uh, the last thing we want is that we, when we work so hard and something transformative comes and completely dis disrupt our, 
what we have done and, uh, and, and just shift the whole world through to a different place. I think we need to be aware about what's really going on. Uh, back to you, Olivia. Um, I think I think that sums up um, really well this uh, Web three uh, our prediction predictions for Web three. Uh, I think I think it also answers the questions that were being asked in the uh, uh, chat group just now. Um, finally, to close, uh, next slide. Any questions? Just let us know. Uh, Sania, Jangan, and I will be happy to 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 share, talk to you more about it. Uh, coming up next, uh, just just want to let you know we have our really really. Uh, um, exciting Southeast Asia for the Re landscape report coming up uh, to the public on the 18th of Jan. Uh, please sign up for it if you're interested for investors, corporate um, alike. And then uh, next slide. Uh, just to sum up, um, this talk was brought to you by Momentum Academy. Thank you so much for taking your time in the first week of Jan to join us. Uh, um, reach out to us if you have any questions, you want to know anything, I'll be happy to share with you our insights. And then finally, the final slides, the final orange slide to, to get in touch with us if you want coffee, if you want to, to catch up. So have a great uh, weekend, everybody. And thank you so much for joining this call. Thank you. Thank you.